try this. We're going to share a screen here with Saki. And it's the first time we've done this. So Scott, I believe everybody should see the diagram that you wanted to talk from and I'll let you take it from here. All right. Thanks, Kirk, for letting me be a participant with this. And also thank you for all this effort that you're doing. Sal, I'm glad you're joining me tonight. Chime in where you see necessary. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do is just stay on this screen right here. And we're going to be talking about the same numbers of people. Uh, we'll get to some videos a little bit later, as Kirk was explaining. But I would like to talk about initially the side zones when the ball leaves the middle of the field as umpires. Uh, the umpires are standing on the red side of the formation. Uh, if I was an umpire and it, if it was a right-handed quarterback, I would probably just be off number 27 to the right on your screen and a yard back, pretty much right behind number 19, a yard behind number 27. That would be my pre-snap position. I always line up uh, where the linebackers take me. In fact, when I line up and I, leave, I set the ball down and leave to the defensive backfield, I might go back seven or eight yards. And then I let the defensive formation get themselves set, especially the linebackers. Wherever the linebackers go, I'm a yard off and a yard behind them. I just stay that consistent with the linebackers. So I move up. Uh, my pre-staff takes me back about eight yards, and then I'll probably move up four uh, once the backers get set. So what I'm also trying to talk about is holding and the difference between a run up the middle and uh, a run or a pass to a side zone in the flat. Uh, runs up the middle, holding, you really only got the referee and the umpire that uh, have any chance of realistically getting holding up the middle. Uh, I want to just preface, everything should be at the point of attack. We don't want to be getting into holding that is not near the point of attack. So that leads me to the point that I'm going to be making here. Uh, number 84 goes in motion, and he's pretty much right behind number 67 when the snap occurs. That's where the yellow X occurs. The snap is occurring when number 84 is right there. And he's going to keep going to our left. And let's just say quarterback 14 pitches it to 84. And he starts going toward the sideline. <clears throat> um, what I'd like to say is the middle of the field, if number 84 is now outside of the hash with the ball in his possession, there's really not much holding we're going to want to be calling on those interior linemen. We could preface this example by saying maybe uh, number 67, like Monarch High School, is a pulling guard. Maybe he pulls out and runs down. Number 12, the back, runs out and leads a formation. 16 and 34. So um, in a sweep formation, 67, 12, 16, 34, and perhaps even 71, those five players will have a chance to get out to the side zone. They are the threats. Uh, they are going to be the ones that will be at the point of attack. So as they're going out, then that means this group, whoops, I meant to draw a circle. Just a second. This group, no, the circles don't work too good. I'll get off that. Um, so there's five people on blue offense going to the left. The other linemen are probably tied up with their blocking schemes from the snap. Once that ball starts leaving, and by God, it will go quickly. It will leave that area quickly. Very similar to a shotgun formation and whether you can do the legal blocking uh, below the waist and so forth. Uh, this ball is leaving that middle of the field zone very, very quickly. These, can you see my mouse? No? We can see your lines. Yes, but I, if I move my mouse, you can't see that? No. Can you see it now? All right, I won't, I won't use the mouse. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, those five blue offensive people are going out, and they're probably going to start taking on uh, number 11, number 86, 27, and 18. Those are the first point of attack people that are probably going to get at number 84. 11 is going to come up, 86 is going to come up, 18 is going to come up. So as an umpire, you've read run, 
you're standing behind number 19, just to the right of 27 and behind 27, there's no reason for you to get to the line of scrimmage. You're not convinced it's a pass yet. The moment that ball starts leading that middle of the area field, you guys have got to leave these linemen alone. If there's holding going on there, it's not at the point of attack. So can you shift your focus to the right? Remember, you're four yards back now from the line of scrimmage. So everything will be in front of the runner. That is, according to the halo principles, the areas that you're supposed to be watching. So if you stay in the same general position as your pre-snap, until the runner gets to the 43, 44, will you be seeing him at his side? What I'm trying to say is, think of it this way. Can you recognize the run is going to a side zone and say, yes, I will take care of my initial snap action that I have to watch for with the linemen, but don't dwell on those linemen anymore. They are no longer at the point of attack. The threats are the five blues that I'm indicating. They're the ones that could possibly be holding. They're the ones that could do the blindside blocks. They're the ones that are going to be threatening this number 18, red 27, red 11, red 86. So the point is, watch your initial snap action, turn your head to the right, and start picking out the threats that are going there. Don't stay with those people in the middle of the line of scrimmage. Sal, what are your thoughts on what I've said? Yeah, let's talk about the easiest way to – I mean, I think the most important thing that umpires do is decide whether it's a, uh, it's a run or a pass. Uh, that initial read, if we get a good initial read on run or pass, that really uh, makes our job uh, a lot. You know, we can focus on, on the one or the other. If, uh, you know, uh, the way you show there was 67, the way he pulled back, uh, I'm assuming 62 is blocking probably down to his right. Uh, you know, we, we, that's, that's our two keys is, are those guards. As soon as we see that 67 pulling back, and 62 probably blocking down to his right. That should tell us it's probably not going to be a pass. Uh, it, it, it's it's going to be a run. And then once we once we decide it's a run, then like you said earlier, then we got to find the point of attack. And obviously, this point of attack is going to be very wide. So then we focus all all our uh, uh, all our focus is over there to uh, be our right the way we're looking at it now would be to the left, but to the um, to the umpire's right. So uh, with with newer umpires, that's the one thing I always really try to impress on them. Get a really, really good early read on whether it's a run or pass, and that, that really makes our job a lot, uh, a lot simpler and we're a lot more efficient if we get that good early read on run or pass. And sometimes we get fooled. You know, sometimes a, a team intentionally makes it look like uh, a pass, like on a draw play, where they, they're making it look like a pass and it's going to be a draw play up the middle, or, uh, or, or it's going to be uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an RPO, you know, run pass option. I mean, those things, sometimes those fool us. Uh, you know, the defense gets fooled, and we, and we get fooled sometimes. But if we can get early reads, uh, that's, that's really, I, I think, the key here. Okay. Um, a little bit forward, backward into the pre-snap position. This X here is where uh, an umpire would stand if it's a right-handed quarterback. The referee is probably somewhere over in here. So the umpire has... Tackle 74, guard 67, center 55, guard 62 as his four linemen that he's watching at the snap. And it's at the snap, as Sal is indicating, where you're going to get uh, the first opportunity to see if maybe 62 is doing downfield blocking, which pretty much will tell you right away that it will not be a pass. Um, if 67 pulls, uh, that's fine. 74 could be downfield blocking. 62 could be downfield blocking. That's telling you, the umpire, there's no reason for you to get to the line of scrimmage. <clears throat> the fact that the snap is being pitched to 84 doesn't mean that 84 can't throw it. So that means if all of these interior linemen are pass blocking and if the quarterback pitches to 84, well, maybe he's going to throw a pass. So, yes, you do have to get to the line. So when I start in pre-snap position, I – look right where this yellow dot is, right between 55 and 67. That's where I center my eyes about helmet high of the center off the ground. And I just keep it focused right there. And what that allows me to do is pick up any false start action by these four linemen. I peripherally have two players on my left and 
two players on my right that I can, and I've got the ball in view as well, if I can pick up any uh, false start action that those interior linemen may be. Then the second is, are they pass blocking or downfield blocking? That will tell you whether or not you got to get to the line of scrimmage. Then you got to understand what the play is doing. This play is going to a side zone and it's leaving this zone very, very quickly to the point that you just got to say, I got to give up on all of these people here and start managing the threats that are over there. If it's truly a run and you're staying right here, the chances of you having to get to the line of scrimmage for anything is nil. You don't have to. You can stay right there and just pivot as the play folds to the left. Keep in mind, we've already spoken. Uh, Kirk will have a video a little later. 86 uh, could have a little bit of an idea that he's going to come straight down here and maybe he takes that pulling guard 67 and cuts him below the <coughs> excuse me, cuts him below the knees, or 71, cuts him out of the action, getting the lead blocker. Those are hard for umpires to catch. They're hard for any five-man mechanics to catch. <coughs> Our best hope could possibly only be the back judge and the near wing in being able to catch that. Kirk and I were talking a little bit earlier today, and uh, there's been times when I've been an umpire and you see a defensive guy just come out of your peripheral and take somebody low and it happens so quick you just can't understand what has happened. After the play is over, you could go talk to the wing. You could say, did 86 cut 67? And upon a conference, two people get together, you may drop a late flag and say, yes, that was the case. What I'm pointing out is never be afraid to go to your fellow peers and discuss a play after the play is over to get things right. Don't just stay on your own island and uh, take the game on yourself. Conferencing with your fellow officials is okay. Sal, you got any comment? Uh, Scott, I can make just, just a comment on that. Um, I, I think it's important if you're going to throw a flag that you see the whole play. Too many times we see, we see the, the back end of a play. And we think, wow, that looks like, to me, that looks like it's illegal. But we didn't see the whole play. Uh, you know, uh, a block in the back, uh, the guy may have started the block in, in the chest and the guy spun on him and he kept contact, which is perfectly legal. Uh, you know, a, a block below the waist, the block may have started above the waist and then the guy slid down and got him below the waist. Again, that's perfectly legal. So I, I think it's important uh, if you don't see the whole play, uh, don't, thro don't throw the flag. Uh, you know, you can talk to the player, if you, you know, if you want about, hey, you know, you, I think you might have gotten him below the waist, you know, I'm going to be watching you, so uh, make sure you don't do that again. That's fine. But don't throw a flag unless you, unless you see the whole play. Uh, too often, we, we just see the back end of the play. Good point. Um, um, talking to players. You know, there could be some action that could be away from the ball, and you just say to yourself, you know, that's a little bit dirty, or it's against the rules. Go talk to that player and just say, I saw what was happening and I let you go because it wasn't at the point of attack, but I'm just letting And he'll remember that. Uh, perhaps the, the conversation is heard by a few other players too. They're going to hear it as well. So that's good, talking to the players. Now, again, with this side zone action, what are the threats? Well, we talked about 86 possibly coming up. Um, any of these, number 12, 16, blue, 34, 71, could blindside block any of these potential 18, 27, 86, 11 red players on the left side of the formation. Those are the ones where now the ball is in the side zone, blue is making a threat against red. And that's what we're looking for. You don't want to stay and dwell on the action of the interior lineman. Now, if it was a run up the middle, you just got to take it for what it is and grab it and run with it uh, as far as what you see. You, runs up the middle are basically two-thirds of the entire uh, 22 players there are at the point of attack with a run up the middle. So there's a lot of things going on. Um, it can't be emphasized enough that throwing a flag away from the point of attack and listening to Lowry and Logan and Yates, uh, they were 
quite adamant about the point of attack. They understand penalties, but they don't understand when a flag is thrown away from the point of attack. That's what we're trying to say at this point in time. Scott, if I can just interrupt real quick. With one exception, if it's, if it's a dirty play, uh, a, a play that uh, threatens somebody's, uh, threatens an injury, uh, somebody's safety, uh, those will throw anywhere on the field. Absolutely. Uh, so a Absolutely. block below the waist, anywhere on the field, uh, we're, we're going to throw. Uh, you know, obviously, any kind of a face mask. Any, any, anything that concerns safety, we're, we're going to throw that flag anywhere on the field. Uh, but again, you know, you know I, Scott is so right. If it's not a safety issue, if, it, if it's a hole, if it's a, you know, a push in the back, uh, let's make sure that it's the point of attack and make sure that it, it gained the, uh, the player who, who offended, that, it gained him sort of, that he gained some sort of an advantage by doing that. And uh, if it's a way and it's not a safety issue, let's, let's just talk to people. All right. We've always stated that uh, grandma has to see the hold from the stands for it to be a, a legitimate call. Keep in mind, a sweep to the side zone, if you got number 34 blocking against number 18, he could give him just the slightest tug of his jersey just as 84 is rounding the corner and that slight little tug is what springs him for a 60-yard TD in this case, 40-yard uh, TD in this case. Um, that's the type of holding that grandma may not see from the stands, but we've got to grab those. They can spring a runner very quickly, just the slightest little tug on number 18, and 84 is gone for the end zone. So you can forgive a lot of holding in the middle, but holding at the perimeter against a runner that all he needs is just one little edge to get a spring, we can't forgive those. We've got to be able to say, I saw something, it sprung the runner. We've got to get that guy. <clears throat> what do you think, Sal? I totally agree with you. It's, uh, it, it, it's not the amount or, or you know, the, uh, the force or the severity of, of the foul as much as it is the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the advantage that was gained by the player. Uh, I think that's what we have to keep in mind. How much of an advantage did he really gain by, uh, by doing what he did and, and, ba and base our decision whether to throw a flag or not uh, on that? Okay, so now let's talk about the backside. And we, well, we've sort of been talking about it a little bit already that if uh, 84 is now basically at the line of scrimmage, and let's say he's to the left of 18 and 34, um, everybody else is on the backside of that play. We've got to get off those backside players, except for a safety issue. So don't just linger and say, I'm going to just stay with the linemen and the interior part of the formation, because all you're hunting for at that point in time is personal fouls, and personal fouls don't come very often, or any other safety-related matter very often. We just have to be lucky enough to be able to catch it. So initially, you're looking straight ahead into the line action for your pre-snap formation, 84 about the time you're done getting all that ascertained, 84 is probably very near the sideline, and you are now, as an umpire, starting to get the backside action. So once, uh, let me get the drawing button here. Once the player gets right in here, 84, you're pretty much even with him, so you've got responsibility for side threat against 84 that's clear over in the side zone. These interior people, you got to let them go. Then when 84 gets down here, you've got backside or behind the scene action. And unless there's a player that looks like he's going to catch 84, no doubt about it, uh, you could keep an eye on him. But other than that, if people have absolutely no chance of getting to that player, you've got to let those people go and not watch them anymore. So it's it's not let your eyes drift from the initial snap over to the side zone. You got to watch your initial lineman and then shift your attention with a very abrupt swivel of your head to the right side or the left side in this case <clears throat> to catch any side action and then the ultimate behind the, the scene action. Sal, comment? Uh, no, I totally agree. Uh, just one thing maybe, any, any, any backside action, uh, Whoever the, the linesman or, or, or the uh, or the line judge on our right side is going to have to they're going to have to have a very wide angle 
and make sure nothing cheap happens, make sure there's no personal files and stuff. They could, they could really help clean up on that because they're, they're working the backside and they, they really don't have that much else to do on a, on a play that's away from them like that. So uh, we, we don't really have to worry, shouldn't have to worry too much about that. The, the, uh, the wing on, on our right side as we look at the picture should be pick, picking up most of that uh, 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 stupid stuff that happens. It's, Yes, we're uh, really emphasizing more and more the last couple of years of wings staying home. I don't want to drift into too many wing comments right night or tonight, but uh, uh, it's so true it is. We we shouldn't just be taking off downfield, um, anticipating something. Whatever the receivers are doing, I'm going to follow them. We can't do that. You do not have to be as a wing, even with your players going down the field. So staying home wings will help in all this action that we're describing as far as being a partner of officiating with your fellow officials. Um, sometimes these transfers of responsibilities happen so quickly that uh, one moment it's the umpire's halo, just a second later it could be a wing's halo, and a second later after that it could be the back judge's halo. So <clears throat> keep in mind that the halos shift, the responsibilities of the halos shift, and most importantly is let the backside action go away, get off of those people as much as possible. All right, I'd like to uh, shift the conversation to some ineligibles and illegal touching. <clears throat> First of all, um, the illegal touching or anybody 50 through 79 does not have the right to touch the ball. They can't bat it, they can't muff it, they can't catch it. So what do those three things say? They say hands. If 71, 62, 55, 67, 74, if their hands touch that ball, it's illegal touching. You could call it a bat, you could call it a muff, you could call it a catch, whatever. Their hands are involved. If any of those five people are hit in the back by the quarterback, he throws a forward pass and maybe it hits number 62 flat in the back, you disregard that. <clears throat> Inadvertent touching, we let go because the hands are not involved. Now let's say 62 goes five yards downfield and 14 hits him in the back, or hits him in the hands, I should say. You've got illegal touching and an ineligible downfield. Um, you're probably gonna take the uh, penalty that has loss of down. Didn't we have this kind of discussion a couple of weeks ago, it seems like? Um, so <clears throat> the same thing goes on. If 62 gets hit in the back, and then subsequently center 55 catches the pass, that's illegal touching on 55, not on 62. If number 63 red raises his hands up and bats it or blocks it or whatever the pass, and then 55 catches it, it's all legal. Because B touched the ball, therefore it's legal for anybody after that to catch that pass. So, with illegal touching, my advice to everybody is just say, we're hands involved. Batting, muffing, catching. Just say the word hands. If hands are involved by ineligible numbers, it's illegal touching. Now, a slight converse to that is, let's say quarterback uh, <clears throat> is under a little bit of duress and he hits number 55 square in the back. Like I said, you don't have illegal touching, but we may have intentional grounding. Maybe that quarterback intentionally threw it in the back of 55 by the judgment of the referee in order to uh, safeguard against it being intercepted, then you've got intentional grounding. If 55 goes downfield five yards and quarterback hits him in the back, you have ineligible downfield and potentially intentional grounding. So the combinations could uh, play themselves out a little bit differently depending on what the ineligible numbers have done with their hands. Comment, Sal? No, I, I think what you, what you said pretty much covered it all. Okay. Um, now, another comment I'd like to make about umpire is, let me draw it. This is your, let me get the line. If this is your pre-snap position, and let's say 14 drops back, scra scrambles a little bit, and he's out over here scrambling, and everybody is pass blocking, 
That's when the umpire needs to get to the line of scrimmage. What I would like to emphasize with everybody is we don't have to beat the quarterback to the line of scrimmage to see if he's going to throw an illegal forward pass. We just have to be at the line of scrimmage the same time that the quarterback gets to the line of scrimmage. So in most cases, you can walk with a brisk walk to the line of scrimmage and you can make your pace faster if it looks like the quarterback is getting closer to the line of scrimmage. But if the quarterback is still deep in the backfield and you know it's a pass, you don't have to get to that line and absolutely wait for him to get there. Just mirror the quarterback and get to the line of scrimmage the same time he gets to the line of scrimmage. And the really the only thing I got to say about an illegal forward pass over the line of scrimmage is it's got to be blatant. Don't split a hair. Don't say, well, the back foot was behind the line. The front foot was over the line. The ball was thrown about equal with the line. Don't get into any of that. Make it blatant. I'm considering blatant to be a yard and a half. Comment, Sal? Yeah. Uh, you know, we always talk about when, as soon as we read a pass that we want that umpire to get to the line of scrimmage. There's three reasons why we do that. Number one is to see if there's any ineligibles that cross the line of scrimmage. If some, if some uh, lineman runs by you and you're at the line of scrimmage, you know you have an ineligible downfield. The second one is, does the pass cross the line of scrimmage? If, uh, uh, if, if the pass is caught behind the line of scrimmage, obviously we can have people downfield. And the third one is what you mentioned already, which is, uh, does the quarterback cross the line of scrimmage be before he throws, uh, you know, before he releases the pass? So there's, there's three reasons why we want to get to, uh, you know, three things we're looking for and three reasons why we want to be at the line of scrimmage. And I think for younger umpires, that's one of the uh, hardest things to do is to realize that, uh, that we need to get there. And, you know, again, we don't want to run, but we want to get there, you know, quick, you know, as quick as we possibly can, you know, without running uh, a, a jogger or, or, you know, some quick steps. And the, uh, uh, and, and, if we, and if we're near the line of scrimmage, we, we can make all those three decisions about, you know, what, what's happening around us. Okay, uh, good points. Um, the, almost every pass play that goes beyond the line of scrimmage, soon as, if it's a short pass, I obviously watch closely for the action of the pass, but if it's a deep pass, I'm putting my head on a swivel and I'm just looking for those blue ineligibles being someplace they're not supposed to be. Again, when the ball leaves the quarterback's hand is where they're at at that point in time. Don't make the judgment when the ball is caught or when it's well in flight downfield because all of those things, those linemen can drift further and further while the ball's in flight or uh, maybe it's a deep pass. So it's when the ball leaves the quarterback's hand is where you got to make the judgment. So umpires, when there's a pass over the line of scrimmage, Put your head on the swivel, and I mean look back to your left and look back to your right and see if you can catch any of those uh, ineligibles downfield. You might get a chance where you see 67 just forgot what the play was and he took off straight downfield run blocking, and you might see that right away, and then you say, oh, there's a pass, and you can uh, capture 67 real quick. But most of my uh, ineligibles downfield have been – after the ball has been thrown, that I've got to swivel my head and start looking for those numbers real quick. Comments, Al? Oh, one of the things that I do, and I think a lot of us do, is uh, I, I cheat on the play. Uh, if it's uh, third and long and, and the, there's a, a team that passes quite a bit, chances are it's going to be a pass. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, you know, I, I always try to be between four and seven yards uh, behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, you know, that's just sort of a starting area. If I know that, or if I believe that this is going to be a pass, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to be right at that four-yard mark if the linebackers let me get that close. So that way I can get the line of scrimmage a little quicker. If it's, uh, you know, uh, if, I, if I've got Columbine and it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, second and three, chances are they're going to run the ball. So I'm probably going to stay that seven yards back. First of all, it'll keep me out of the play. They run up the middle. And I'll get a better look at the blocking. So, so think about down and distance. Uh, on, on every on every play, we should be thinking down in distance. We should be thinking about what kind of a team is this? Are they a passing team? Are they a running team? Uh, you know, th try, try to think like a uh, like a defensive coordinator about where, you, where you're going to set up and what you're going to be looking for. And and like I said, uh, 
vary your position so that you can so you can cheat and, and, and get a jump on on that line of scrimmage, or you can stay back and get a good look at the blockers on a, on a running play. Scott, there's a, com- Scott, there's a comment on uh, on the chat from Toby about uh, expanding a little bit on the expanded neutral zone. Talk a little bit more about the expanded neutral zone in this case. Okay, uh, the, the expanded neutral zone would allow you to go up to the 38-yard line, the ineligibles. But they've got to be engaged and driving the defensive backward. The expanded neutral zone isn't there for somebody to just drift that they're not blocking. The other thing about the expanded neutral zone, uh, and I think we might have a video later, is it does not expand into the end zone. So if it's second and goal from the 12-inch line, the expanded neutral zone is only 12 inches. If it's second and goal from the two-and-a-half-yard line, the expanded neutral zone is the full two yards to the half-yard line. So I'm just relaying to everybody that the neutral zone is not expanded into the end zone. Uh, So the adage is, if you see an ineligible standing in the end zone on a pass play, he's probably illegal because it does not expand into the neutral zone. And I believe that that we've got a new rule coming out this year. I haven't studied it in detail yet, but I believe it eliminates the need to be engaged with a defensive player. I think they're making some flexibility with that. I don't want to get into that, but I remember seeing that, that that might be a new change this year. You might be right on that one too, and I don't have enough – I'm too naive to even comment on that. I I don't know uh, exactly what's going there. That is enough for me on this uh, uh, little still screenshot thing here. Kirk, if you want to get into some videos, we can do that. Oh, is that Rusty McWright I see in the screen that there? Is, that is Rusty. I think he can unmute himself while I make a transition here. What was that old bear story? Or Grizzly Adams. Adams. Grizzly <laughs> Adams, yes. It's, it's the mountain look. <laughs> Is that your she shed you're in now? Nay. <laughs> I can go get in the she shed, but then you're going to want to move up here, Scott. I can't have that. <laughs> All right. Well, glad to see you, Rusty. Thank you for joining us. All right. We're going to we'll, we'll click through some plays here to finish up uh, the night. So, as Scott mentioned, this first play is a – has to do with linemen down – I'm sorry, with illegal touching. That's where we're going to start is a touching issue by a lineman. So, green is on offense, screen play. I stopped it there. The ball should be right at the tip of the green player right here. There's the ball. And so it, it's hard to tell from the film if – let me go backwards again. It's hard to tell from the film if the ball is tipped by this defensive player that's, that's jumping up right now, the white player jumping up. I believe it is not tipped by him and touched by the hands of the green player right behind him ricochets and then caught by a fellow lineman. So let's assume that's the, that's what happened. There was no touch by B, but it was touched by a lineman A and then, or lineman one and then lineman two. As Scott mentioned, now we've got illegal touching. If that ball was tipped by the defensive lineman, we got nothing. And I think the key here is we've got to communicate as a crew. Uh, maybe the, uh, the umpire didn't see a touch by B. Maybe the white hat after the ball was, was released, he could see that ball tipped by B. And he comes in and has to overrule that call. That's why it's very important that we, we report a foul with some details of what happened here. Anybody want to add anything? No, oh. you made the point. Go ahead. So, as, as far as the rule, it, let's assume the ball was not tipped, okay? So, uh, as, an, as an umpire, we need to throw our flag. This, this, this has to be a slot foul because this is a foul. You know, it's a passing play. It's a foul by the offense behind the basic spot, which is the uh, previous spot. So, we got to make sure we get a flag down where the ball is tipped because that's going to be our enforcement spot. Good point. When, when I say the ball is tipped, where the ball is tipped by the offensive lineman. Because that's uh, again, that, that's going to be our. Uh, th- that's where we're going to penalize from. Good point. Getting the spot foul in that case because that is the enforcement spot. Um, go to the next one, Kurt. 
Oh, that's fuzzy. Yeah, that's pretty fuzzy. And that's a really wide, wide shot. Yeah, you guys probably can't even tell what's going on here, but I'll describe what's happening. So offense is on the right, right, my right. I assume that's your right. Is that correct, Scott? Yes. Is the offense on your right? So they're in white. He's good. The quarterback's going to throw the ball, and an offensive lineman is going to catch it and flea flicker it to a back. And he runs down the sideline. So it's kind of hard to see what happened there, but hopefully the flag comes out. Here's an end zone view of it. I believe the flag does come out here. There it is, the flag on the right side of your screen. So we got that right, illegal touching. Now, in this case, Sal, the touching is beyond the line of scrimmage. Right. So, 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 so it, it's a loose ball play. So our basic spot's going to be the previous spot. So now we're going to go back to that line of scrimmage and right. move it back. Loss of down, correct? That is a loss of down. All right, let's see what else we have here. All right, we're going to talk about um, – Scott and Sal talked about the uh, quarterback's feet and how accurate we need to be at this. I don't know about you guys, but uh, – I feel fortunate when the the, uh, the stake is opposite of where I'm lined up and the quarterback's between me and the stake, man. When that pass is behind me or on the backside of that stake, you feel like you're plus or minus a couple yards. I think that's why I think it's important that it's, it needs to be a no-doubter. Um, we don't want to get ticky-tack. So here we've got a quarterback that's going to roll to the right, pull up, and throw. I'll take you back to see where the line of scrimmage is. Line of scrimmage, I believe, is right. And you can see the umpire moving into position. So the line of scrimmage is right here. And so the, the umpire rotates, sees the pass. In this case, did not feel it was, uh, it was big enough. I don't think it was big enough either. And again, the, it's so much tougher when that stake is behind you instead of in front of you. I'd say when in doubt, we leave these alone. This is not something that we, that we want to have a coach come back and, and nitpick us on, uh, on the details here. I think there's a little bit more forgiveness if we uh, let it go. All right, so here's one where snap is from the A49. Now, this one's a little bit different than what Saki was talking about. If most of the time, your quarterback is going to throw the ball after he gets flushed out of the pocket excuse me, out of the pocket, and we've got a little bit of time to get to the line of scrimmage. This is a case where the quarterback comes straight up the gut and launches the ball right at that 49-yard line. I don't know how blurry it is on your end, but it is a close call. I'd let that one go myself. So you can see the flag come out. At the 50. I don't think we're interested in getting in whether it was accurate or inaccurate of a foul. I think what we want to do is get the, rop, the proper mechanics to get us in a position. Um, you know, if I, I always hear, and Saki's heard the same, when Chassa gets calls from coaches and they send film, the first thing they do is see if we're in the right position. You, know, you can question our judgment, but if we're working hard to be in the right position, Chassa won't, won't dispute anything. They'll say, well, he was, he was right there. How can we dispute what he saw? He was in the right position. Kirk is right. Uh, Tom Robinson, 95% of his initial conversation is, was the official in the right position? And if he was, he's going to go with the official's call. Hey, Kirk. Yep. Take, take a look at that interior lineman. I can't tell if it's the center of the guard. He goes and he blocks that, that linebacker who's just, just to the left and in front of the umpire. He goes yep. down there and blocks this guy. Watch. Do we have an eligible downfield? So that's the uh, that's why this play is in here. And and just oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought it was the same play. Oh no, this is this is the next play. Okay, my bad. So uh, and that's in here for that very reason. Uh, we had uh, Coach Philman from Regis talk about the RPO, and that's what this is. So you got he would he would not be happy that his uh, snapper is coming downfield on that. Um, that linebacker, and as you can see here, that freezes umpires. You got a uh, 
a snapper that comes straight out the block. It looks like a run block. It's a tough play to see. And so, yeah, he's, he's set right at two yards. But he went that two yards uninhibited. Um, yep. he, he, he wasn't pushing that defensive guy back those two yards. He went hunting for him. That is true. He went two, at least two, if not three. He might have even got to three without any contact with a, an opponent. It's, it's tough to see. Like, you know, even as the umpire, like in this position, this umpire, you don't have a good angle to even know exactly where the line of scrimmage was. It's tough to tell one yard, two yard, three yards a lot of times. I but think but, but the fact like, that he was not engaged, and again, this is under the old rule, right. the fact that he was not engaged with the lineman, uh, the fact that he went, he, walked, he went those two or three yards and then engaged, to me that tells me he's an eligible, that he's an ineligible downfield. And there's, this is the same, same snapper here. That one's worse than the last one. Yeah. Okay, so here, I, this one's in here to, uh, to talk about what happens when a lineman goes downfield and then comes back. So let me see if I can find it for you guys. Let me back up here. I'll get, I'll get a uh, cursor on him now that I've found him. He's going he's gonna to he's gonna start right here. And you'll see him. Actually, I think it's that guy. I was off by one. I believe that's 79 right there. And then he comes back. So what's our ruling on a lineman that goes down and comes back? He's still downfield. guilty. He's still guilty. You don't, you don't get a pass, a hall pass, to come back to the line of scrimmage. Once you're downfield, you're illegally downfield. As long as the pass crosses the line of scrimmage. Right. So it's not immediately a foul. And who knows, I, this pass may have even been at or behind the line of scrimmage in the end anyway. It looks like a screen pass. That's right at the line of scrimmage too. There's a lot, uh, a lot of stuff in that case. So again, if, if you got a flag for ineligible downfield, throw your flag and, and talk to your wings. Find out if the ball caught, crossed the line of scrimmage, if they've got it beyond or not. Communication's a key ingredient. Anybody got anything else on, on this one? Just make them blatant. All right. This, uh, this one is the, uh, the play that Scott was talking about a little bit ago. Now, this ball is not staffed at the 12-yard line, but that's our uh, Sal Marini in the end zone right there as an umpire. And we are in goal line stand. And uh, we're going to see a lineman. The right tackle. Right tackle. Right there, number 66. Is that the, is that the thief? Yes. Mm -hmm. In the end zone. And an astute umpire that Sal is says, you can't do that. And boy, did Sal take some heat for this call. Again, he, he, he didn't have contact. Yeah. He released, and he went and, and he contacted a linebacker. Uh, that's, you know, that's really unfair to the defense, with the, especially if that linebacker is in pass coverage, that a lineman comes out and blocks him. That, uh, that's not what the rules uh, allow a, a, a lineman to do. Let's uh, talk about something here. Just as much as umpires – rely on whether the linemen are pass blocking or run blocking defensive backs and linebackers are reading those linemen just as we read them too so when they start seeing 66 charging downfield they're thinking run and they're putting themselves at the disadvantage um i still have studied this play for many times sal and i still think that cornerback got sucked up by watching number 66 coming downfield I, I you know I, I was a little confused because I, I'm a, on a pass that 66 is, is one of is one of my four guys that I'm keying on okay so initially I read pass so you see me I'm, I'm moving towards the line of scrimmage because I read pass but then I see 66 and I'm thinking you know this this could be a draw player a screen pass I, I was I was a little befuddled that uh 66 released downfield like that and I'm thinking this can't this can't be a pass downfield then of course when he does throw it downfield and, and if you watch that linebacker that, that the guy bumps, he may have been the one that had the coverage on the guy. I, I don't know that. You know, I don't know what kind of defense they were in. I think the defense was fooled by number 66. One or two players were fooled by him he, going downfield. He, he somewhat fooled me. 
Well, I know that uh, the umpires in the metro area, we were we were celebrating this call because we knew it was right. There were a lot of people that weren't weren't in support of it, but that's the rule. It says you can't be in that end zone as a lineman on a pass, no matter what. And, and the fact that he wasn't in, you know, if he would have pushed the guy back that far, I might have let that go, even though the rules says that's still, you know, not part of the expanded neutral zone. If he would have pushed the guy back, but he didn't. He released. He released and had nobody to block until he until he got to that linebacker. And then he didn't really. I mean, he bumped the linebacker. Didn't really block him, but he did bump that linebacker. But the fact that he released on his own and wasn't uh, wasn't engaged. Now, from what you said, that they may not be a, a rule uh, coming up that, that they have to stay engaged. But uh, the fact that it was in the end zone, I think, makes that yeah, call double. double uh, either way. All right, this play on my notes, I've got an ineligible downfield. I think this is going to be a screen pass. So the, the umpire gets tricked here, and I can see how it happens. Let me see if I can get your uh, bearings on this because it's probably pretty blurry. So we're going to have, we're going to have linemen. We've got a lineman releasing downfield a long ways. Umpire is going to move forward, and we're going to have a pass, and I'll show you where the pass is caught right. Oh, shoot, sorry about that. Right. So the pass is caught by this player right here, the screen pass. The umpire misreads what happened here, does not recognize that it's a screen, throws a flag on these ineligibles downfield. And this is a play that we should have come together and overruled this. So they ruled it an ineligible downfield instead of uh, waving this flag off because the ball did not cross the, the uh, neutral zone. That's that's where the off wing official, the official near us, he should really be able to help with that. Since since the play is away from him, he should be able to to run up there and tell the umpire, hey, that ball didn't cross the line of scrimmage. We need we need to wave that off because he because I, I can see the other wing moving downfield because all the action's coming towards him. But yeah, this, the near wing doesn't need to move at all, and he, he doesn't need to move at all. The action's going away from him. I mean, you know, if he wants to drift a yard or two downfield, that's fine. But he but he should be he should be able to tell uh, the umpire that that ball was caught behind the line of scrimmage. So really what we're saying here, line of scrimmage action is, has a lot to do with the wings as well, as far as our conversation with ineligibles. Um, and staying home, once again, wings stay home a little bit longer than what you might have traditionally wanted to do. There's no reason for a wing to be dead even with a receiver. Uh, you can be somewhat well behind those receivers and still make great calls and have full control of the game. Okay, I've got uh, just a couple minutes here. Let's let's look at a couple plays where we've got blocking below the waist. And so let me let me get your eyes trained on where you're going to see a block below the waist. And I agree wholeheartedly with what Scott was saying earlier. I mean, this stuff this stuff's tough to see if if it's players that are not already in our view as an umpire. When we see a cornerback or a safety come flying in low, we can't tell if he fell into a tackle or it, it's just hard to tell what happened. This particular case, you got a linebacker, and we're going to focus on this character right here. And you can tell he is, his intent is to take out that lead blocker. See him just roll his shoulder and back into the, into the lead blocker. We might be able to get that one as umpires. But, you know, we've got, we've got a uh, back judge back there that's just watching a run play that could probably help us see that happen as well. And so we have, we have got to do our best to eradicate this from the game. Because that's a that's a safety foul, and if we don't catch them, they're just going to continue to do it. Let's see if I got another one here. Okay, so here this is this is the uh, defensive end. Let me get started here. Right there, we're going to see him dive at the legs of the lead blocker, which is the uh, pulling guard. I believe this guy's coming down the line. So we'll see it taking out the legs of the lead blocker. This is going to have to be supported by the referee. Umpires, we're not going to see this, so this probably isn't necessarily for this conversation. But that wing's got to have his eyes on blocking and not the ball carrier. I think I got one more here. I think this is one where the safety comes up. Let's see if we can. Yeah, so this, I, I think this is almost impossible for us as umpires to catch, but I like Scott's comment. If we see something like this that's happening, I think we come together with our wings and back judge and say, did that, did, 
did that guy go low? And sometimes that's all it takes for the, the wings or back judges to go, yeah, I saw that too. If he, if he hit him low, we've got to throw a flag on that. There's nothing wrong with making that flag late for a safety foul like that. So you can see this, uh, you can see this safety come in, taking a dive at the lead blocker right there, taking out the knees. You know, the back judge probably has the best look at that. I would agree. Yeah, because I think our wing is is closer to the line of scrimmage with his his focus. This ball is, or this block below the waist is a long ways from the ball carrier too. Ball carrier is in the backfield, and that uh, that safety comes up and takes a huge one. All right, I've got eight thirty two, gentlemen. Sorry, Rusty, I should have probably uh, prompted you for some more mic time. Um, gentlemen, you got any parting thoughts? Otherwise, we'll release these guys. Thank you guys for joining us. Sal, you first. Uh, hey, let's hope we have a season this year, huh? I'll, everybody, be safe and take care of yourselves. Amen to that. Saki, you? Yeah, I hope we have a season two. I just cannot read these tea leaves, what's going on right now. It's, uh, it's weird as heck. Um, but a little bit from tonight, just remember, point of attack and let the backside players go. We, we don't need to be watching space, as we've had in other conversations, and we don't need to be watching players that are not at the point of attack. I got two things. So, oh, Rusty, go. Well, one, one thing I'd like to say is a friend of mine by the name of Mike DeFee uh, just got called up by the NFL. And one of the things that I asked him back when I was in Texas, I asked him, I said, you know, I said, how, how are you so knowledgeable? And he told me something that was <laughs> kind of profound. He said every March he takes his rule book and he puts it on the back of his toilet. And every time he goes <laughs> and takes a dump, he would sit there and read that book. And so by the time football season rolled around, he had some additional knowledge that maybe he didn't know the season before. So I said all that to say this. It's not too late to get in that book and start learning your position. Hey, well said. I like it. 